from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous, vile, and disturbing behaviors. Special thanks to some of my patrons, Ariel, Elise, Chantel, Sonia, Dan, Maya, Linda, Teresa, my dear three Emmas, Jessica, Lady Janice, Elena, Alethea, John, Nanette, Rachel, Sophie, Whitney, David, Catherine, Trudy, and Stacy. Thank you guys so much. You are truly appreciated. And for anyone else, please feel free to join my patron. Like, share, subscribe. It just might help our little community grow. And if you happen to watch on YouTube and also use Spotify, consider watching on Spotify instead as they have been kind enough to sponsor me and well, we all know how YouTube treats us. But my podcasts are all written in advance with a listener only in mind, so nothing is missed. This week's podcast will be on Stephen Port. So Stephen Port was born on February 22nd, 1975 in Southend-on-Sea in southeastern Essex in England. So as we always do, let's get into some history for that time. In 1975, the Vietnam War finally ended as communist forces took Saigon and South Vietnam surrendered. The United States then carried out, quote, Operation Baby Lift out of Vietnam, bringing orphans back to the U.S. Spanish dictator Francisco Franco, the leader of Spain at the time, died at the age of 82. He had taken over power in 1939 after his nationalist forces defeated the Republic during the Spanish Civil War. After his death, the monarchy was restored and the country returned to democracy. Also in 1975, an IRA hit squad took refuge as well as hostages in central London. They bombed the London Hilton Hotel and murdered Ross McWhorter, who was the co-founder of the Guinness Book of World Records. In Morocco, the Green March with 350,000 unnamed citizens crossed the border into the Spanish-controlled area of Western Sahara, demanding the return of the Moroccan Sahara Desert. The King of Saudi Arabia was assassinated. The U.S. pulled out of Cambodia. The inflation rate in the U.K. reached 25%. New York City barely avoided bankruptcy when President Ford signed a $2.3 billion loan. Oil prices increased by 10%, making it cost over $13 a barrel at that time. The British Conservative Party chose its first woman leader, Margaret Thatcher. The movie Jaws was released, which is now a classic. NASA launched the first joint U.S. and Soviet Union spaceflight. Bruce Springsteen released his third album, Born to Run. Saturday Night Live premiered and Muhammad Ali beat Joe Frazier. The average cost of a car was about $4,250 and a gallon of gas was just 44 cents. The average price of a house was $12,000 or rent would have been about $200 a month. The average income was $14,000. So this was the atmosphere that Stephen was born into. Stephen's parents were Albert and Joan Port. Though he was born in Southend-on-Sea, around the age of one, his parents moved to Dagenham in East London, which wasn't far away. And while I don't see why this is significant enough to warrant every single source mentioning it and calling attention to it, apparently it was a big deal. 
His parents, for all intents and purposes, seem to just be average working class people. I found no criminal history regarding either parent. There were no statements about the parents being cruel or overly strict. All information points to two very normal, average, and loving parents. He did have a sister. Now, Stephen himself was described as a shy and very quiet child. He was so withdrawn, in fact, that it has been said that some of the kids at his primary school thought he was deaf because he wouldn't react or respond to the other children who tried to talk to him. As he reached puberty, he began growing quite tall, and because of this, his classmates called him Stretch. But he seemed very much anxious all of his life. As a small boy, through his teenage years, he isolated and was detached from his peers. He was quite introverted and was content with his own company, not needing attention from anyone. One thing he did enjoy was art, which he felt he had a real talent for. So once he got through school, he entered into an art college. And guys, that's all we have for his childhood. It's not much, but let's get into it. We have really no concerns with the environment he grew up in. From what I understand, East London and that area during the 80s was a lower working class area. We can infer that he at least didn't do without the basic necessities such as food, water, shelter, clothing, and so on. Nothing to show that he was neglected in any way. And again, there is no information pointing to an abusive parent or a parent with any mental illness. While we can't know for sure whether or not his parents were super nurturing, attentive, and so on, we also have no proof that they weren't. They later spoke of just how shy and backwards he was with people that he never spoke up. To me, this sounds like, at the very least, moderately concerned parents. There are also no reports that show he suffered from any major childhood illnesses or experienced any head trauma. All signs point to a well-cared-for, safe but quiet, shy, introverted child. So let's look at that. According to the Center for Parenting Education, research has shown that 75% of individuals are categorized as extroverts. Extroverts seek stimulation outside of themselves and prefer to be with others to get their energy. More often than not, their qualities are valued more than those of introverts. Consequently, extroverts receive more positive reinforcement from those around them. Introverts often feel out of place and, as a result, may need to develop extra coping skills to help them feel good about who they are. Introverts tend to need time to process their experiences and do not readily talk about what they are thinking, so the adults in their lives may need to reach beyond the surface to discover what's going on inside their minds. And also, there is a very strong biological basis for where people fall on the extroversion versus introversion spectrum. Parents or trusted adults might be able to help pull a child a bit in one direction or the other, but basically, it isn't possible to change the child from an introvert to an extrovert. It is hardwired. Introverts prefer internal thinking as a way to cope with the world and can be overwhelmed by sights and sounds and tend to narrow their experiences but go deeply into those areas they have chosen to focus on. They are strong listeners, seek solitude for renewal, prefer not to share their emotions, have a very high self-awareness, learn through observation, are quiet in social settings, see inner reflection as very important, and so on. Reaching introverted children can be as simple as adding opportunities for creative expression throughout the day. It can be an incredibly positive experience when introverted children are exposed to many forms of art, music, science, and literature. And we see this with Stephen as he absolutely loved art. But these people are sensitive to people, places, and things around them, and it is crucial to observe and not exceed their threshold for outside stimulation. 
Now, not all introverts are necessarily shy and don't always experience social anxiety, but we see that Stephen suffered with this very much, so his needs would have been more intense than the typical introverted child. But this still isn't enough to explain his future crimes. So we have decent, if not great, parents who understood his personality. I found nothing indicating they forced him to do anything to break him out of his shell, so to speak. If he played any sports or did anything outside of school or home, I certainly could find no information about that. His parents provided. He didn't do without what he needed. There is no illness, no head trauma. He received a decent education. We know from his crimes that he was homosexual and from interviews with his parents, his father primarily did not approve of this lifestyle. Reading their interviews, you get the sense that they thought he would eventually settle down with a nice girl, you know, the usual hope. But he was born and was a teenager during times when it was a little bit more socially acceptable to be openly gay, but he never really came out to his parents, not for a while, which could of course be a source of contention. This makes me think back to Jeffrey Dahmer and how he adored and looked up to his father who was vehemently against homosexuality. In my opinion, and mine only, I'm just not seeing anything in his background with the information I was able to find out about his family and childhood that says to me that he could be a future murderer. So let's get back into it. So while in art school, this would be a time in his life where he was truly happy. But unfortunately, he was forced to drop out because his parents simply couldn't afford the tuition. It is said that this angered him greatly. And we can imagine how very disappointed he would have been that he felt he could no longer pursue his passion. So Stephen then went on to train as a chef and actually showed a gift for it. But he was still very upset because he felt that he was a very talented artist and he wasn't getting to be one. He began working as a chef at a stagecoach bus depot in West Ham. So in the very early 2000s, he came out to his parents that he was gay, which sources said disappointed them as they wanted him to settle down and all of that. But nowhere did I read or find that they were hurtful or bitter towards him about it either. In 2005, at the age of 30, he finally moved out of his parents' house, which is a bit older than most of his generation. Stephen moved into an apartment in Barking, East London, not very far at all from his parents. One of his neighbors from that area, who was also one of the only other gay men in the neighborhood, stated that he was a, quote, man of few words, and that he was quite tall, but walked with an almost bit of a lumber or a lurch. If people talked to him, he would look down and not make eye contact with people. If he answered, it was only one or two words. Now this neighbor and Stephen became friends and the neighbor remarked that he thought something in Stephen's mental development was stunted and shared a story about how he was going to have a party at his apartment and invited some people, including Stephen. He found a toy fire truck and gave it to his friend as sort of a joke, but that Stephen sat cross-legged on the floor and played with that truck while the party continued around him. Indeed, he did have a childlike quality to him. Apparently, he was collecting toys as an adult, which is certainly not abnormal, but he also played with them as a child would, which isn't necessarily typical either. Now, because he was so cripplingly and socially awkward, he found it nearly impossible to meet men and begin dating. So he did what many innocently do. He joined the online dating scene. Social media was actually something that he was excited about. You know, the ability to interact without really having to, well, you know, interact. He joined many different social media sites, though he did sort of struggle with what to say on his profile about himself. But due to that disconnect, he decided to talk himself up a bit. On his Facebook, as an example, he said he had studied at the University of Oxford, that he was a formal naval flight officer for Her Majesty's Royal Navy, and that he was a special needs catering teacher at Westminster Kingsway College at King's Cross. But of course, none of that was true. 
and experts believe he was trying on a few different identities, if you will. He posted tons of selfies, and it was obvious that he did take care of himself. He was, in fact, long and lean, often taking mirror selfies with no shirt on. But Stephen wasn't using current photos of himself, see, rather using ones from when he was much younger. And he was losing his hair, so he took to wearing a blonde toupee to cover it as he was highly insecure about it. But he did advertise the attractive side of himself, and because of this, his neighbor reported that it was not entirely unusual to see a different young man at Stephen's apartment every day. His neighbor and friend noted that Stephen was attracted to men noticeably younger than he, and especially to younger men who were more vulnerable, small, and perhaps more feminine. What Stephen really craved, aside from all of that, was ultimate control. The young men he dated said that he was quite manipulative and degrading toward them, that he was argumentative and all around mentally abusive. Once Stephen was fully into the dating scene, he began to take it even further and was attending and throwing drug-fueled sex parties. One of his friends came to his apartment one day and noticed that on Stephen's coffee table was a rather large container filled with bottles containing some liquid drug as well as baggies of white powder that the friend assumed was cocaine. He stated after that he distanced himself from Stephen and they weren't really friends after. With each new boyfriend he acquired, the aggression and sometimes violence escalated, fueled by the drugs he was habitually taking. By June 2014, the now 39-year-old Stephen was fully into the online dating scene, using apps on his phone, most notably Grindr, to meet up with and hook up with boys in their early 20s. A search of his computer later showed his search history, which was quite telling. He was looking for ever increasingly disturbing sexual stimulation to try to satiate his disturbing sexual appetite. He watched what sources stated were pornographic videos of older, bigger men mock raping younger, much smaller men. Then when that wasn't enough, he began to make his own home movies in much the same fashion by luring young men to his apartment, drugging them, then raping them. Then on June 15, 2014, Stephen contacted 23-year-old fashion student Anthony Walgate through a mail escort service website and offered him 1,800 pounds to spend the night with him. Anthony agreed and they scheduled their night for two days later on the 17th. On June 19th, Anthony's dead body was found just outside of Stephen's apartment but it was Stephen himself that called the police. He said, quote, there's a young boy. Looks like he's collapsed outside. Looks like he collapsed or had a seizure or something, or he's just drunk, end quote. Inside of Anthony's bag, which was sitting beside him, was a bottle that contained the drug GHB, which is often referred to as liquid ecstasy. For those that aren't familiar, Ecstasy is a drug that is usually distributed amongst young adults at bars, parties, clubs, and all-night raves. The liquid form is usually put into alcoholic drinks. It causes the person under the influence to experience euphoria, increased sex drive, and a sense of tranquility. But it can also cause sweating, nausea, hallucinations, amnesia, loss of consciousness, coma, and death. Now, it appeared that Anthony had overdosed on GHB. His family, however, was not so certain and believed he died under suspicious circumstances. They hounded Scotland Yard, and eventually Stephen was questioned. But more on that in a bit. Less than a month after killing Anthony, Stephen met 22-year-old Gabriel Kovari, who had come to London from Slovakia looking for a new life on a dating site. Around August 23, 2014, he moved into Stephen's apartment after he had told the young man he could sleep on the couch rent-free. Gabriel had absolutely no intention of becoming intimate with Stephen, as he had told a friend, 
but the living arrangement was worth it. However, after a few days, Gabriel wanted to move out. On August 28th, Gabriel's body was found near Stephen's apartment in a graveyard by a person walking their dog. He had been propped up, had sunglasses on, and a bag was next to him with his belongings. Then immediately after, Stephen created a fake Facebook profile and friended Gabriel's boyfriend, then began casually asking how the police investigation was going. Stephen then met 21-year-old chef Daniel Whitworth on a dating site called Fit Lad. He chatted with Daniel before the murder of Gabriel. Then Stephen met up with Daniel on September 18th, about three weeks later. Daniel's boss reported him missing the next day when he didn't show up to work. And the day after that, two days after meeting Stephen, his body was found in the graveyard at St. Margaret's Church in the exact same spot that Gabriel had been found. Again, the body was propped up and again, the same person walking their dog found the body. And again, the police believed the young man had died of a drug overdose. This time though, Stephen had written a suicide letter that basically stated Daniel was the one who had killed Gabriel, but that it was an accident and quote, by the way, please do not blame the guy I was with last night. He knows nothing of what I have done, end quote. Daniel's parents were able to see the letter and they knew Daniel hadn't written it. And more importantly, his parents wanted to know who the guy was he mentioned he had been with. It was at this point that the murders began to be noticed by the LGBTQ plus community and the fact that the police had not made any formal statement or asked for any possible information. When the community pressed, the police assured them there was nothing unusual or suspicious about the deaths. Now remember, Stephen was questioned after the first death, Anthony, right? Well, Anthony had texted some friends that he was meeting a guy that night and it was connected that Stephen, the guy who had called 999, was the guy that Anthony had met up with. Since he had lied about not knowing who the young man was dead outside of his apartment, he was arrested and charged with, quote, perverting the course of justice and a court date was set. So he made bail and he was free to go until then. Then in March, 2015, he pled guilty and was sentenced to just eight months in prison. He only served two. In June, he was free to kill again. Three months later in September, nearly a year after his last murder, Stephen met up with 25-year-old Jack Taylor, whom he had met on Grinder. Jack worked as a forklift driver and had been out for a few drinks before meeting up with Stephen. The next day, get this, his body was found in the same graveyard as the previous two victims. This was clearly Stephen's favorite dump site. Yet another drug overdose, but this time, Jack's family insisted on seeing any security footage from any local cameras where Jack was last seen that might show them what had happened. The footage showed Jack meeting up with Stephen Port at Barking Station, heading over to Stephen's apartment. Then in just under five hours of meeting Jack, Stephen had blocked his Grindr account, thus believing he had hidden his and Jack's connection. The police shared the image and the now 40-year-old Stephen was recognized. On October 15, 2015, he was arrested for all four murders. During a search of his apartment, they investigated his laptop where they found his very disturbing search history, as well as videos of him raping unconscious men. After the investigation, he was charged with eight additional rapes stemming back from 2012 until then. He pled not guilty, but was convicted of 22 offenses against 11 men, which included the four murders. He was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Since then, the police are investigating other mysterious deaths involving similar circumstances, and it is currently still ongoing. 
And an interesting tidbit of information, Steven starred in the British show Celebrity MasterChef, cooking alongside singer J.B. Gill and actress Emma Barton in 2014. He was wearing his blonde toupee and dressed in the crisp white chef's clothing we are all familiar with. He would have starred in this sometime during his murders. I think every one of us is fully aware that crimes committed within and against the LGBTQ plus community go unreported surprisingly more often than not, which is unfortunate. Regardless of what anyone thinks of people who live a lifestyle that they don't agree with, if they aren't hurting anyone, everything is consensual, then it isn't anyone's place to judge. And hiding behind your religion won't work either because nearly all religions state it isn't your job to judge. So there's that. These are flesh and blood people who have families that love them, who want to live their lives in peace. What they do behind closed doors is no one's business. It is, in my opinion, inexcusable that he was not caught after Anthony's murder and most likely due to just a lack of detailed information. I see no real reason he turned out to be a serial killer. He wanted power and control over his much smaller, much younger victims, and he seemed to be, in his own way, punishing them. But for what? Tell me, guys, what do you think? Leave me a comment below or DM me on Instagram at serial underscore killing. All of my contact information is below. And most importantly, thank you guys so much for listening because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me and I really appreciate that. Thanks guys. Have a great day. Yeah, anybody who killed more than two or three people was a mass murderer. And whether it was all at one place or over an extended period of time. And then uh, in the early 80s, they came up with this differentiation called serial killing.